Welcome to the CCFR Radio Podcast, your source for news, updates, and stories from the CCFR. Hey everybody, welcome to episode 127 of the CCFR Radio Podcast. I'm your host, Rod Tackett. Thanks for joining me again today on the podcast. We have another mega episode. There's so much going on. You know, it's not, life is not boring if you're a licensed gun owner in Canada, that's for sure. Uh, but I will say this, a lot of the news today is good news. So I'm really excited to share that with you. As usual, we'll bring on Tracy and we got a lot to talk with Tracy about. And as usual, I got this whole list of stuff that I got to get through before we bring her on. But before we get started, I just want to thank some of the businesses in our community that support the CCFR and make this podcast possible. See Tom's Academy provides life-saving training in trauma care and human performance, perfect for outdoor enthusiasts, hunters, shooters. You can check them out at ctomsinc.com. That's ctomsinc.com. And if you're in the market for firearms, ammunition, cold weather gear, you name it, you'll find it all through our friends at North Pro Sports. You can check them out at northprosports.com. That's northprosports.com. And also our great friends over at the Saskatchewan Rivers Chapter of Safari Club International. They do a lot of great work over there, including supporting the CCFR. So make sure you check them out at saskriversci.com. That's saskriversci.com. And of course, Vortex, the force of optics. We'd like to thank our friends over at Vortex Canada for continuing to support the CCFR radio podcast. You can check out all their exceptional products at vortexcanada.net. That's vortexcanada.net. All right, we are back. So first thing I want to talk about is um, in our court case, uh, CCF, the CCFR at all versus Canada, we have a court uh, a case management meeting on October the 3rd. So that's your court case update. Now, what that means is in this meeting, we're hoping to get dates for a trial, dates for a hearing. And we were hoping that, or it was looking like in summertime that our hearing would be sometime in... Uh, at the end of September, if not October, and the courts are completely backed up. And <laughs> there's a lot of big court cases against the government right now, if you're not aware of that. Uh, but anyway, uh, that's uh, it is what it is. So we, we're probably looking at um, a, a trial date. Um, I think, what is it? We're, we're asking for seven days for that, for that hearing and the government, or no, we were asking for five and the government wants seven. I don't know, something like that. But that negotiation and the scheduling, I think will happen on October 3rd. But whatever we find out after the case man management meeting, I will make sure is up on propertyjustice.ca. So I don't know, I'm thinking the third, maybe the fifth, sixth or something like that. You can look for an update on the website. So I wanted to mention that. Next thing, the Mass Casualty Commission. So as you know, the CCFR is a uh, received standing to be a participant in the Mass Casualty Commission. And it's it's been, you know, this has been dragging on for two years. And it's, uh, I, I wish that we could have been more involved than we were, but even at the level of involvement that we did have in the commission and its activities was a tremendous amount of work. It was very difficult. And you pile that on top of everything else we got going on as an organization, it was, it's, I'll be glad when that's over. So the reason I bring up the MCC is we had our final oral presentations, basically our last word, our last speeches uh, before the commission um, completes its mandate, which is to look at, figure out what actually happened on April 18th and 19th, 2020, uh, the, the spree shooting in Nova Scotia, and also um, look at their recommendations of how this could be mitigated or prevented in the future. Now, as you know, when someone breaks from society the way that this perpetrator did, there's pretty much nothing you can do. Because if they don't have access to this, that, or the other thing, they'll find something else. They'll drive over people in a van attack. They'll run around stabbing people, which as you well know, you can kill 10 people and injure another 19. I mean, it's, it's, you can do a lot of damage if you're motivated to do that. And you know that, I know that. But anyway, um, this, this inquiry is, is really important for those reasons. I think and I don't pretend for a second to speak for the victims, but if I were to put myself in those shoes, which is near impossible until you're one of those people till it happens to you. But if I were to try to do that, I my main focus is I understand this event, but I want to know what happened. And I think a lot of the family members, certainly the ones that I've had the opportunity to talk to, which is 
uh, a real honor for me. It's just really valuable for me to get that insight because it's hard to put yourself in those shoes, like I said. But people want to know what happened, like exactly what happened. What role did everyone play in this? And that is, that's probably the most important thing. Certainly for me as an outside, uh, outside observer, how about that? That's the most important thing. Like what happened here? How come this guy was running around for beyond a decade, threatening to kill everybody, <laughs> you know, had 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 unlawful possession of firearms, all kinds of firearms, shooting them at his cabin. Everybody knew about it. He had multiple contacts with the RCMP, threatened to kill his own parents. Like, you know, in, in, involved in domestic violence with his wife. Every, you know, like just all kinds of, all kinds of stuff was going on there. We need to know what really happened. So anyway, I think that's, in my mind, the most important part of it. So we were granted um, status as a participant. And what happens with them, with the uh, MCC, pardon me, is when you have groups or individuals that have the have a similar have the same or similar perspective and expertise, and they want to bring that to the commission as as participants. Sometimes they'll lump them together, and they'll be treated as one participant. So what I'm saying is, let's say the participant in their final oral presentation gets 20 minutes. We are in a uh, coalition. Um, participant coalition with the NFA. So either the NFA or the CCFR could speak for both groups for 20 minutes, or we split the time. We have 10 minutes each. So that's usually what, what we decide to do in our relationship with the NFA. Now, the Coalition for Gun Control was granted status by itself. So they got 20 minutes in the final oral, oral presentations, and I got 10 minutes, and Blair Hagan of the NFA got 10 minutes. Nonetheless... That's all, that's all right because there's rules and and we respect that because this has been dragging on for two years and the commission has to do something and there's there is an abundance of opinions and reports and recommendations and all that stuff there they have they have the information they need if they want to you know render recommendations so having said that so we did these presentations. If you want to check it out, there's a video here on the YouTube channel. You, I think it's on Rumble. If I remember correctly, it's floating around on Facebook. But if you go to the CCFR channel on on uh, YouTube, you can find that speech. And, and I actually wrote that speech and read it. So it's fairly well delivered, not my usual rambling, you know. Uh, so And because it was important, I only had 10 minutes and I had a, a lot to say. So those were the rules that everyone agreed to. So Blair Hagan, who did a great job, uh, 10 minutes, I had 10 minutes and the, and the Coalition for Gun Control had 20 minutes. So in my speech, I talked about the concern that I had with a lot of these groups. And I guess, to be honest, with the commission itself, because when these tragedies happen, there are groups and individuals that look at all this as, oh, look at all these people in immeasurable pain. I can stand on top of them and get my message heard. Because if I claim to want to help, Everybody's going to be like, how are you going to help these victims? And they hand you the microphone. And it's like, okay, now the mic is mine. And now I can just, I, now I have an audience. Everybody's paying attention to me. And that's not the way it's supposed to be. It's abhorrent, but it happens every single time there's a tragedy in Canada and in the United States. Everybody runs to get, to capture some of that attention to get heard. And they sidestep what their, the mandate, the reason why they're being listened to, and they just say their own thing. Right, and and the coalition for gun control is notorious for that. Right, they just they couldn't care less. It seems seems like, but they'll just go on, and they didn't disappoint. So I stuck right to my to the reason I was there. I was there to say was there to advise on was that were there any firearm regulations that could have stopped any of this from happening. That's that's what our role there is, and I'm really pleased to say that Blair Hagan at the NFA did a really good job too, and he stuck. To the reason why we were there. And so, and of course I did not, and, and, you know, I don't blame people for doing something and then I'll do it myself. I led by example. I mean, I'm sure I could have got my message heard on behalf of the CCFR and use that, but it's like, it's not, that's not the reason we were given standing, but this, the coalition for gun control, oh, they didn't disappoint. They basically sidestepped the entire mandate that they were given there, the entire reason they were being asked. And it's and then they're like, here's our 10 commandments. Here's what we want. We want gun control in Canada. We want license holders this and license holders that and the system to do this and all this stuff. It basically just use that time to talk about their platform as a gun control organization. Com just I don't think it could have been worse. Not only that was the 
the lady that was representing the Coalition for Gun Control, Wendy didn't do it for some reason, but I think this was a lawyer. I don't know that. But the Coalition for Gun Control got, they applied for and got funding. They got money to hire a lawyer to represent their organization to the commission. So the taxpayers actually paid for that, I think, if that was a lawyer. I'm not sure. And don't quote me on that because I don't sp spread information that I don't know without at least a disclaimer saying I don't know. She went on for 30 minutes with her 10 commandments that she wanted. You know, gun owners stripped of their guns, handguns banned, all the rest of that stuff. This had nothing to do with the spree shooting in Nova Scotia, nothing. Because this wasn't a licensed individual. He had no connections to the licensed, you know, to the firearm community. He smuggled all of his guns. They weren't even illegally sourced within Canada. All the relevant firearms other than one that he obtained through fraud. But we don't know that he even shot anybody with that one. It was all the ones that he smuggled. It was a handgun and a, and a rifle. It was an AR-15 smuggled in from the United States. Just what a mess. What a mess. Okay, so <laughs> so I, I, I do my final oral presentation. I wrote all out and everything, and there's some really important things in there. One of the important things is, and it's it's part of the reality of the event itself. The only people to survive an interaction with this with the perpetrator at their home, the only people to survive, the only ones, were ones that the perpetrator knew were licensed gun owners, that that licensed gun owner had a shotgun loaded and at the ready, and whose wife was on the line with 911. We don't know, and I haven't gotten information, but I'm gonna try to dig around and see if I can get it, whether or not the gun owner yell, was yelling, if that guy comes in, I'm going to shoot him or whatever it was. He yelled something like that. We don't know if, if Wartman heard him. Okay, so that's what I'm trying to say. But the only, does, and, but none of, none of that even matters. The only thing is that we know those are the only people to survive that type of interaction with them were the people that had a loaded gun, okay? I'm not even... Like, listen to what I'm saying. I'm not providing commentary on it. I'm merely saying that that's, that's the objectively true fact, just by itself. And that's what I said in my speech. So check this guy out. This is uh, Graham Benjamin. He works for Global News. So he's watching this whole thing in real time. He gets on Twitter, okay, as you do when you're a journalist, I guess, and he writes this. Rod Giltaka with the Canadian Coalition for Firearm Rights is speaking in front of the Mass Casualty Commission arguing that the mass shooting wouldn't have been severe if more homeowners had guns. Like, can you imagine that? Then he writes a very complimentary, a nice non-biased assessment of what the, the lady from the Coalition for Gun Control said right below that. So it's like, oh, here's the gun nut. And, you know, and it's basically what he said is not true. And then a complimentary thing like, you know, you people wonder why the media is in such a disarray why people just don't believe anything the media says because it's like you're you're like literally hiring twitter trolls as journalists and they and then they try to they try to stick the word journalist on themselves like no I'm a journalist like no you're somebody that spreads disinformation on purpose because the purpose of him framing what I said like that the purpose wasn't that people would know the impact of what I said it's to try to discredit me he doesn't know me. He doesn't know the CCFR. He doesn't know any of those things, I would imagine. But it's like, oh, no, I'm against you anyway because I already have a preconceived opinion. I've already made my decision about all this stuff. And I'm going to make sure that I drag you through the mud using global news as a platform. So if people are, are listening to global news for whatever reason that is, I'm going to, I'm going to leverage that and, and just troll this guy that I don't know who's 8,800 kilometers away. And I'm just going to, you know, I'm going to patronize him. So anyway, his response is, when I say, this is what I, is this what I said, Graham? People like you are the reason. Few believe anything the media says. Global should reprimand you, your disgrace. Okay, so he responds, deep breath. So he thinks he should, after he behaved like this, he thinks he should patronize me. So he said, yes, you did here. So of course he posts the video. And that's not at all what I said. <laughs> so anyway, this guy he starts to get savaged, and then he deletes the he, de he deletes the the tweet. Right? He's like, oh, you know. And then I did tell him that it was going to become a problem for him because I would have sued him. And so he's deleted it. So he's kind of escaped, you know, the damage part of it. But I would have sued him for that because it's it's like these people. It's fun. It's it's all of a sudden become my job to police them to make sure that what they say is factually true. 
that what they say is honest and so that they don't mislead the people that would watch global news. Apparently, that's my job. Apparently, it's your job to fund it as a member of the CCFR, your job to pay for that kind of policing. It's just, it's insane. All right, I appreciate you hanging this long with me and uh, listening to my long story. But uh, anyway, I thought it was just kind of interesting, a little bit of a snapshot of what's going on in Canada and what, and a snapshot of what needs to stop at some point in the near future. But anyway, all right, let's bring on Tracy. All right, via Skype, we've got Tracy Wilson of the CCFR on the line. Uh, Wilson, I, pull, I pulled away <laughs> from the mic. I pulled away from the mic a little bit to see if I could get it to not because right away the limiter hits, you know, cuts in and just prevents me from getting a good strong Wilson out there. We need a good strong Wilson. It's very important. We do. All right. So I know you're a little bit uh, a little bit sick. Um, your voice is been- yeah. Speaking of strong Wilsons, I'm a little bit down with a cold, but nothing yeah. serious. Not the Rona, nothing I won't get over in a day or two. Well, I appreciate you um, still making it on the podcast and on the TV show. Absolutely. All right, here's the good news. The good news is there's tons of good news. Okay, so we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna just jump right into it. Um, uh, fresh off the wire from I think it was the day before yesterday, uh, the Al, the Attorney General of Al, Attorney General of Alberta says no thanks to the uh, as you call it. Marco Mendicino and the liberal NDP government's war on gun owners, like full on war on gun owners. Yeah. They say, no, thanks. We're not only going to um, not help you confiscate guns, even though you sent me a message in a bottle pleading for my help, but <laughs> uh, but we're we're actually going to prevent you from doing it in the province. What uh, What's the whole skinny on that? Yeah. So as you mentioned, Marco Mendicino has, who's the federal public safety minister, has sent communications out to the provinces asking them to help him with the gun grab. So, of course, it's been since May 2020 that the Liberals banned, you know, over 1,500 uh, models and variants of guns. And they keep promising this buyback program, which translates to a mandatory confiscation program. But, of course, they have no idea how to do it. It's virtually impossible. So now they're starting to reach out to the provinces for help. So... Tyler Shandro, who's the Attorney General for Alberta, published this letter. And in there, basically, Marco's asking for their help. Um, and Tyler's like, no, man, no, it's a no from us. So here's the breakdown. The Alberta does not have a provincial police force. Like here in Ontario, we've got the OPP. Alberta doesn't have a provincial police force. So they engaged the RCMP at a bill of $750 million a year to act as their provincial police force, carry out routine policing, you know, crime investigation, you know, all the stuff, normal stuff cops do, right? Um, but what Marco's asking is, hey, can they also go and start confiscating guns from legal gun owners? And Chandra said, no, absolutely not. Uh, we don't pay them for that. We're not going to facilitate that. And in fact, we're going to go a step further and protect Alberta gun owners by intervening on the core challenges against the gun ban. So, of course, that's our challenge. There's a couple other ones as well. And they are applying to intervene on them. So they're going full out. So it's it's great. There's been a lot of wild social media over this. But, yeah, it's good news for Alberta and gun owners. It is. It's fantastic news. And as far as the intervention is concerned, if, if people don't know exactly what the significance of that is, is the Alberta government is going to be providing um, uh, arguments to the court why and I think they're going to be talking about the constitutional question like can the go can the government yeah. just reach into your life and take whatever they want uh, can they bypass the provinces anyways a bunch of stuff there and why that's good for uh, the cases so CCFR versus Canada at all CCFR at all versus Canada the reason why that's good is we end up with more legal research we end up with a legal team that none of the cases including the ccfr have to pay for so that's just more people lining up digging around trying to find solutions to these things and you know the alberta government is doing that we're not having to do it so really great and it lends a little bit of credibility to our side as as well yeah now one thing i do want to highlight is <clears throat> the cfo the the provincially appointed chief firearms officer of alberta uh dr terry bryant has been really, really great. Her responsibility as a CFO is to administer the Firearms Act within the province that she works, which is Alberta, and also to be the sort of a guardian of public safety, make sure that um, using the Firearms Act and her other authorities, she, uh, she safeguards public safety. Well, Terry Bryan also knows that 
her mandate is not to be um, uh, the facilitator of punishing licensed gun owners whenever the NDP liberal government decides they want to energize their base or whatever, do things for political purposes. So her comments were actually really interesting. If you think of it in the context of this is her message to the federal government and to gun owners, it's really even keeled. It, it's completely moral and it just makes perfect sense. So I just wanted to play that video for you. So just check that out and we'll be right back. Property. I'll now invite Alberta's chief firearms officer, Terry Bryant, to come to the podium to provide some remarks. Thank you, Terry. <coughs> My position as a provincially appointed chief firearms officer specifies that I have a dual role to supervise the administration of the licensing and other provisions of the Firearms Act in its current form and to advocate for common sense changes to ensure the law remains focused on criminal misuse of firearms and avoids imposing unnecessary burdens on the law-abiding firearms community. In the latter capacity, I have previously expressed strong opposition to the federal government's plans to prohibit and confiscate some 30,000 lawfully acquired firearms from Albertans. These prohibitions were not based on any sound principle or evidence, were not subjected to rigorous parliamentary scrutiny before the order in council was imposed, and have no meaningful connection to any public safety goals. No consultations worthy of the name have been undertaken with respect to the proposed compensation schedule, and no concrete practical plan has been proposed as to how owners would take advantage of it, even if it did exist and they did want to do so. Together with the proposed handgun transfer freeze now before Parliament, the planned confiscations represent a failed approach to reducing violence in Canadian society and are unwarranted and unacceptable infringements on the property rights and personal freedoms of Albertans. All Canadians, whether firearms owners or not, should be concerned by the scapegoating of law-abiding citizens and the targeting of their property, which sets a disturbing precedent and by the misuse of billions of taxpayer dollars that these plans would entail. Even if these costs can be contained to just $2 billion, that would cover the costs of some 12,000 person years of regulatory and enforcement personnel, or a fully paid 20-year career for some 600 people. I am gratified to see today's announcements as concrete indicators of the steadfast position of Minister Shandro and the Alberta government as a whole to support law-abiding firearms owners and to oppose Ottawa's misguided measures by all means available under current legislative frameworks. I look forward to working with all branches of the Alberta government to ensure that we leave no stone unturned in our efforts to protect Albertans from Ottawa's senseless overreach and to redirect attention to where it belongs, to criminals smuggling, trafficking, and misusing firearms in ways that threaten public safety. Thank you. Okay, so I just, anyway, I thought that was worth listening to. They're just, I really appreciate someone that understands what their responsibilities are and doesn't let politics taint, you know, her, uh, doesn't let politics, um, put her in a position where they're going to abuse their authority and abuse the people that they have authority over, I think is what I'm trying to say. Uh, all yeah, right. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's not it for the good news. So all this stuff no, that Alberta wait, was more. doing, yeah, all the stuff that Alberta was doing is inspiring maybe some other provinces to say, you know what, we're not going to listen to immoral, politically motivated uh, abuse of our legal system and our and of our citizens. That's right. So the Saskatchewan CFO was on the John Garmley show this morning, which of course is a massively popular news talk radio show out in SK. And he confirmed that Saskatchewan um, also agrees. So Premier Scott Moe will not be allocating the, the RTMP that he funds to Marco Mendicino to carry out his dirty work. So then there were two. Um, he has yet to say whether or not he's intervening on the court challenges. Of course, I've got some communications out to them as well as our legal team has. And uh, yeah, we'll we'll just see how this snowball keeps rolling down the hill. But it looks like the provinces are lining up saying, no, if you guys want to continue the war on gun owners, um, you do it on your own. We're not going to, uh, we're not gonna help you. Yeah, that's so, awesome. Yeah. And, and you know what, one more thing, and just a kind of a random thought. 
it's my understanding that the National Police Federation, the RCMP union, told the government to poke it, that they didn't even have enough people to do policing, which I think is kind of important. Yeah. I don't know. I'm biased that way. And, and that they wouldn't be helping. They wouldn't be lifting a finger to help the government. And then the government kind of ends around maybe is, and is talking to the provinces like, you guys are actually paying this bill. You could probably yes. instruct the RCMP to do it. You know, it's slippery. It's just mark well, them. everything they've done is slippery. If you think about yeah. it, with C-71, with the handgun transfer ban, with all of these measures coming down the line, what they do is they're lumping all this extra work on the CFOs and, and, and whatever. They just It's easy to make a law or make a regulation and just say, make it so. But somebody actually has to carry that out. And every gun owner knows, try and call into a CFO or whatever, and they're just, they are just buried. You can't get well, through. Well, do you think the Liberal government has put forward any funding to alleviate that on the provinces? Of course not. So now the provinces are incurring expenses to carry out or facilitate uh, the Liberal anti-gun agenda. And this is going to, this would be one massive expense for each province. Um, and of course, it would also look good for Marco to not run up such a bill federally because he could mitigate those expenses, right? Yeah. And the provinces are wise to this. They're they're pretty sick of it. And trying, so. to, and trying to do an end around the RCMP's union too. Yeah. And, oh, yeah, interesting. exactly. Anyways, um, so of course there's heads exploding. People are like, you know, how dare a province defy the federal government, you know, and not just do what they tell them to, no questions asked, which is hilarious because f provincial governments do that all the time. If you're thinking like oh, yeah. language laws or sovereignty in the case of Quebec or or um, uh, to do with medical services, they do with, they push back against the federal government all the time and 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 are uncooperative. It's pretty hilarious. But guns is such a, a political and divisive issue that the people that are completely obsessed with what you or I are doing, you know, in our own private lives, you know, they their heads are exploding now. Um, speaking of exploding heads, these spin doctors for <laughs> protection from guns, and they, you know, they're like literally, they're they're feeling defeated. You know, they've been they've been riding high for seven years, right? Just getting the oh, platform yeah. and getting whatever they want, uh, despite the fact that they spread disinformation on a regular basis. And if they want to come after me for that, then they're more than welcome to do it because we had people actually read all of the studies, read all of their, you know, overwhelming scientific evidence. And what they say it says, it doesn't say that at all. But anyway, their heads exploded, but they can't even, now that they're starting to feel demoralized, you can see their level of effort go way down. They literally phoned it in or, or wrote a letter uh, about all this. Oh yeah, they're totally out of gas. So um, you're 100% you're right. They keep saying, you know, well, all the, you know, overwhelming scientific evidence and, and whatever, but, but yeah, that's what it comes down to is well, the science doesn't say what they say it says. Um, so yeah, they just seem to be getting really lazy about that and they're feeling deflated and just mailing it in. But yeah, here we are. Um, and it's, it's interesting to watch it unfold because at the end of the day, the whole time, all we've ever asked for is fair and effective legislation for gun owners and credible work on crime, right? So, um, yeah, it's just it's just wild to see the whole thing unfold. But good for the premiers standing up to the feds for sure. Yeah, and and good for the good for the docs. You know, it's uh, <laughs> anyway well deserved. You know, I'm not even going to get into that because it just doesn't really go anywhere beneficial. But uh, all I have to say about that is lol. Um, <laughs> Well, no, which is my Twitter strategy. <laughs> just, I like it. Just lol. You know, it's like, you know, what are you going to say? What are you going to say to people that are completely irrational, right? That's all I can say to them. Well, yeah. um, actually, I, I tweeted, ha ha, lol, I think to, uh, oh, to yeah. Oh, that's different. They got an extra I little, <laughs> and then a lol. But uh, anyways, uh, more good news. <laughs> but wait, there's even more but good wait. news. But wait. There's more. So Pierre Polyev has been the leader of the Conservative Party for about, what, I don't know, two weeks? We were at yeah, TACCOM when he, yeah, yeah, when he won the leadership. And uh, the conservatives are already seven points ahead in the polls. That's not polls of conservatives. This is this is polls of Canadians. Yeah, so this is actually an Angus Reid poll, a brand new one out. And it has the conservatives lunging forward with a seven-point lead. Now, I think that's probably the biggest lead that we've seen since the Harper days. And interestingly enough, when you drill down... Uh, they sort of separated it out by age and gender. And it's interesting because 
with men 18 to 34. So these are young people. And traditionally, the liberals like to think that they've, you know, they've got the advantage over young people. But young people, 48 percent for uh, conservative and only 15 for liberal. And I'll tell you what's going on there is it's young people realizing that the future looks bleak for them. They're not sure if they're ever going to own a house. They're not sure what's going on in this country economically. And yeah, they're they are flocking to the conservative party. So we'll see if this momentum holds up. I think it will. Um, And uh, yeah, but seven point lead. So that's a pretty big spread. And that's got to have the liberals um, just wondering what to do next. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I hope they enjoy it. And, uh, you know, I guess all that to say this whole segment with both of us, the the moral of this story is it's like it's been a rough seven years. Like it's been really, really (laughs) rough and like unprecedented level rough. But we've resisted the whole time. Uh, Sometimes things just work out. You just got to stay the course. The pendulum is swinging. And it's just um, it's funny because and I don't want to go on and on about this because, you know, we could talk about this stuff all day. Certainly I could. But it's like all of these anti-gunner people, all these really crazy leftist, irrational, unreasonable people that can't seem to hold a conversation, <laughs> they, their time is ending. And it's funny because mm-hmm. these kinds of people, by virtue of their personality, they love to <laughs> rub your nose in it, right? There's a, they're always like, oh, you know, I mean, remember this, this guy is like, oh, make sure your guns are clean because we like to take them, you know, when we confiscate them, <laughs> we like to confiscate them when they're clean. All this stuff. It's like yeah. our time is coming and uh, just hang in there, stay the course, keep working everybody and we're going to get there. Yeah, we totally are. They, that's the thing I always tell people is they make it a little uh, worse before it gets better, but it will get better. That's right. So, um, yeah. So I just, I'm really happy to share the good news and thank you for the update. Awesome. We'll see you soon. All right, that's going to do it for episode 127 of the CCFR Radio Podcast. Really appreciate everyone watching the podcast and commenting, and please share it, and the people that are sharing it really appreciate that. We want to get this message out. We want to get people motivated. Uh, We want to get them uh, definitely lined up to either support our organizations and or, I guess, um, but to be there in the next election, right? We need everybody to pull together in in the next election because that's the key to getting all our stuff back, and who knows, maybe even bring a little bit of common sense to firearm regulation in Canada and at the same time get really tough on the people that are committing these criminal acts with firearms. And that's a a good way for the gun issue to not be an issue in future elections because if there's no gun problem, there's really nothing to talk about there. So anyway, thanks again for all your support. Take care and we'll see you soon. This is another episode of the CCFR Radio Podcast. Remember, if you don't stand up for your own ability to own and use firearms, who will? Join the CCFR or donate right now at www.firearmrights.ca.